Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by ShareFile from Citrix. Secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TWIST for a free 30-day trial. And by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website and now an online store. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com slash twist and use offer code TWIST3. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. Today on This Week in Star- Startups, Jim Lauterbach, the CEO of Revision 3, and an old friend of mine, journalist, etc. We're going to talk about web video, selling your company, life after the sale, a lot of great entrepreneurial stuff, and just the booming YouTube ecosystem. Stick with us. It's going to be a great hour. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, um, I just want to take a moment to thank my friends at Squarespace. As you guys know, Launch.co, uh, our blog and our website, all hosted on Squarespace. They do a great job, 24-hour support, exceptional-looking sites, beautiful templates. You know all the great stuff uh, about Squarespace, and it starts at only $24 a month when you sign up for a year. So it's incredibly affordable. But, boy, have they done a game-changer, something incredibly disruptive. Um, I mean, this is pretty amazing. They are now doing commerce. You no longer need to use... Shopify or Majesto or whatever this stuff is uh, you know that people are using you can just get your website and your commerce engine in one place go to squarespace.com slash twist I can't believe they did this what a brilliant idea squarespace.com slash twist to try it out for free no credit card required which means they're confident in what they're doing you know I always say if you're doing uh, no credit card required it means you know people are going to convert at a, in a very large way because your product stands on its own merit if you decide to keep your site after the free trial just use the offer code TWIST3 and you'll get a great discount. Everything you need to create an exceptional website, uh, Squarespace. Squarespace.com slash twist. Only $24 a month. They do an amazing job. I've been using it for four, five, five, four or five years now and I love the product. And what I love about it is I can just like scream over my shoulder like, hey, put this on the website. And they don't have to go to the designer. They don't have to go to the technical person. They don't have to go to the server. They just log in. Anybody logs in. And they fix it. They get a new page on the site, et cetera. And that's what this new shopping thing is. I'm, a, I'm predicting that's going to make Squarespace explode. And that's a really great startup, by the way, in New York. Um, so thanks again to our friends at Squarespace. Go ahead and visit squarespace.com slash twist to try it for free. No credit card required. Use the promo code TWIST3. And... Uh, Let's just all say thank you at Squarespace for making independent media and awesome interviews like this one available for free to the community. I love doing the show, and I, I just love using Squarespace, and I'm really thankful for them for supporting this program that we all love so much. Let's get back to the interview. What are we waiting for? Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calcanis. This is This Week in Startups. You know the program. You know what it's about. The topic is in the title. If you don't know what it's about, we got a serious problem, people. This week in startups, about starting companies, growing them, putting a dent in the universe. Uh, and today on the program, I'm really thrilled to have Jim Louder back with me. He's an old friend. Uh, we've known each other for pff, well over 10 years. Uh, but I knew him when he was the um, editor of Tech TV and before that, PC Magazine, which was my Bible in the 80s and 90s. If you were coming up in tech, you know, just Reading PC Magazine, it literally was the Bible in the 80s uh, and into the 90s. Uh, of course, he then went on to become the CEO of uh, Revision 3, the famous uh, startup founded by Kevin Rose and uh, Jay Adelson and David Prager, which did Dignation, had a billion viewers uh, in, or so. In or the, so. Or so. Just about a bill, a billion viewers, and was um, acquired by Discovery Communications in May of 2012 for a reported $35 million. Uh, welcome to the program. Jim I'm Lauterbach. glad to be here finally. I know. We've been trying to do this show. for like a year or two. I know. I remember seeing it live at South By and it was great. You had such a great lineup. Everybody was really into it. Uh, you had a, I mean, people applauding. It was awesome. Yeah. It's like a mini version of Dignation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought Dig- I w- Dignation doesn't exist anymore, so you're carrying point. the torch. Well, in a way. I mean, Dignation was about... What a great, what a good place to start, though. I mean, Dignation was an incredibly innovative program, wasn't it? It was in many ways, but in many ways, it was a traditional format. It was a buddy movie. It was really two guys hanging out, 
talking about things that were interesting to them. And the reason why people wanted to watch is because they just wanted to hang out with them. Right. Same reason people like to hang out and watch, listen to this show. They just want to hang out. Right. Uh, but boy, did it become huge, huh? I mean, it went from, I remember when Kevin started Dignation, and it was a marketing vehicle for Dig, the website. But ultimately, I think it became, I don't think it, it did it become a bigger business than the website? It certainly, at the peak, would be bigger than now. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You can do the math. We. Uh, um, it know, must we, have done 5 or $10 million in revenue a year, something like that. Mm, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars a year Low in revenue. Certainly, look, it was a, it was a pretty solid, healthy yeah. business, uh, and it really was the foundation on that we built Revision Three on. So, right. you know, you can draw the parallels on like what happened to Revision Three, what we sold to Discovery, what happened to Dig. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit of a rough run there for Kevin, I think, with Dig well, imploding. I, yeah, and look, Kevin. Um, Kevin's done amazing stuff with everything he's done. So yeah. you know, he's managed to. You know, did great stuff with Dig and took that to a certain place. Did great stuff with Revision 3, took that to a certain place. Yeah. Has done great stuff. Uh, is now Google Ventures doing great yeah. stuff. Um, what was it about that show, though, you know, at the time? I mean, I remember meeting Kevin and he said he was losing money on the show because there were so many downloads. Bandwidth was killing the business in the early part of the business. That was the big challenge, wasn't it? For a little while, it was bandwidth. And, you know, one of the early things was uh, getting on Torrent. And so we were torrenting it out as well. And there were a couple different things that early on, and this is... Um, you know, 2006, 2007, yeah. distributed on BitTorrent. There was an early release program where mm. we would charge people, I forget, was it maybe 50 bucks a year, five bucks a month, six bucks a month, and they would get Dignation two or three days in advance. Wow. Which was a good idea, and it brought in some nice money, enough to pay for the bandwidth. Right. Until the, and there was a lot of techie fans, they would take it and then put it on BitTorrent, and everybody would get it on BitTorrent. And, oh, wow. And the problem with that was we started doing you know, sponsorships. I mean, really, we, with the sponsorships we put in Dignation, where Kevin and Alex would talk about products, integrate them in, very much native advertising, far before native advertising was called native. Yeah. Um, the problem with uh, all those guys putting it on torrents is, we were the advertisers, we're we'll guaranteed 200,000 listens, or 200,000 views. And we knew that 20,000 people were watching on BitTorrent. We couldn't count them. Right. So we shut that off. We like, stop it. We're not going to do the early re release program anymore. We're just going to give it to everybody at the same time. We're not going to put it out on BitTorrent as a legit thing. Anybody can right. BitTorrent if they wanted to. Right. Because we needed to be able to track the views. Has that problem even been solved to this day of like tracking ads? I mean, everybody uses promo codes. When, when I do an ad or Leo does an ad on This Week in Tech, we all have to use promo codes to give some sort of idea. But the measurement problem hasn't been solved. It hasn't it? been solved at all. And everybody's got different ways to think about it. Uh, really, you know, if you're on YouTube, you can say YouTube's got their own measurement, trust it or not. How many pre-rolls have you served? That's one way, but YouTube only serves a pre-roll that you can monetize once every you know, four or six views. Um, you've got uh, the usual suspects, Comscore and Nielsen, coming out with their own ways to do it. The Comscore one, we're all sort of following along and seeing what's happening. Nielsen claims they're going to be even bigger than Comscore. We'll see, but no one's figured it out yet. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a big problem for the industry. But well, part of the problem, by the way, if you yeah. want to go back to history, yeah. is... Even with a download, it was very hard because if it was coming off of your server, do you count a play start? Do you count a 200 or a 202, you know, an HTTP code? Right. Which one of those? Because you can, we used to see this, like we would have people, um, I will name no names, who would come in and say, we're doing, you know, a half a million downloads on our show. Every that sounds like day. an Adam Curry impersonation. No, it's not. But <laughs> close. Uh, but, but what no, they were Adam really, Carolla, what, I, who knows? No, 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 not, it wasn't Adam Carolla, no. believe me. Um, He's got huge numbers. Yeah, yeah no, no, but, but the, what, what would happen is people would be tested, they would say, every time you request and start the file downloads, they would, they would the, Count the that ticker as a would view. go on. And now it's a lot, the, the infrastructure is a lot better now than it was in 2006. 2006, you'd have to restart six or seven times. And so oh, people would right. like, for one fully completed download, they'd be like, they would be recording eight, 10, 12 views. Right. Uh, and we know this, I knew it was a problem. Even back at Ziff Davis, when we were doing stuff with um, DLTV with Patrick Norton, right. we were counting fully completed downloads, but our friends at, uh, at Co-op in the game group we're actually coming out with these outrageous numbers, and it turns out as we looked into it, they were actually counting that way on PlayStars. Right, and that's a problem because then the promo code gets used five times for 500,000 views, and it seems pathetic when if it was used five times for 5,000 views, that would seem impressive. Exactly, it reduces the overall effectiveness you go out to an advertiser, or you go to an advertiser where it's not something that you're using promo codes, but it's a branding advertisement, and you say, hey, look, we're gonna put you in, we're gonna, you know, 500 million people are gonna see it, and you know what? They really only reach 50,000. Yeah. And 
and you sour a whole class of advertisers on the right. entire category. That happened early on. And now it seems like there's a certain class of advertisers who are addicted to podcasts, who are addicted to shows. I mean, we we have Citrix as an advertiser. I think you guys had them for a mm -hmm. lot of stuff. Yeah, we still mean, do. We still work still with Citrix. Do. We work with a bunch of... I mean, we all... The, re the reasons why is they're radio advertisers. Ah. Because, look, um, when I talk about web video and the way that we built it out, and you'll, you'll appreciate this because you've done all the same stuff, is I look at it, it's not just television, right? No. It's really, we take sight, sound, motion, and emotion from video. We take the intimacy and authenticity of talk radio, right? right? Like you love Howard Stern. Right. You love Adam Shine from NFL Radio. You know, you love Leo. You love Jason. You love Kevin. And then you take the ability from special interest magazines to go deep into a topic for the people who are absolutely passionate about it, roll that up together into something that's really brand new. But the advertising that works the best in many ways are the ones that used to work on radio. Well, I still do work on radio. Which is the... Which is the, I, you know me, I'm your friend, I'm going to talk to you about a product or service, and then I'm going to say, hey, go sign up. Here's the code. And they do. It's like 1-800-Flowers. It's, um, you know, Valentine's Day is huge for a lot of these advertisers. Because right. you're listening to your ESPN radio, your NFL radio. And like, right, and Howard Stern or Stephen A. Smith are reading the ads. That old-time ad read, is, it just seems to work so brilliantly. It does because, because of that uh, intimacy. Yeah. And it feels like you also don't... It keeps the continuity going on the program. Well, the reason why it works, I think, more than just traditional television, television has a lot of barriers. There are a lot of walls. Mm. There's teleprompters. There's agents. When television is a long way from being authentic and intimate, if you look at what, you know, what we're doing right now, yeah. the people who are listening to this program or watching it, there are no walls. There are no barriers. They all, I'm sure you see this, you're their friend. Right. Right? You, they, they meet you at South By. They meet you on the street. They meet you at launch. They're like... Jason, man, it's so great to see you again. It's not like, oh my God, can I have your autograph? And I'm tired. Right. Tied. It's Jason, I know you. You're my, and that's it creates a level. I call it asymmetrical intimacy. It's like they know so much about you from you talking so much, and so so people feel like they know Veronica or Patrick exactly. Norton or whoever it happens to be. Um, because you're you're there. They see you as their friend. Right. And this is super uh, cool. I think early on, the guy who ran our user group um, and our fan base group in New York, a you know, big Dignation fan, he said, I'm not calling it a fan base. I'm calling it a friend base. Wow. I think that's a really good term to do, because it's not, you know, fans like the people who go, you see, you know, famous person in the restaurant, you go and be like, wow, I, you know, I was, I was in Mill Valley recently going to a concert and I walked by Bob Weir on the street and I'm a big deadhead. Right. I didn't go up to him and say anything. It wasn't like, hey, Bob, I'm your old buddy. How you doing? Yeah. But because he was a star and I was a fan. It's but like this huge gap between the two of you. The stage is a big pit between you. Exactly. Barriers, barriers, yeah, yeah, barriers. Yeah. This medium, yeah. there are no barriers. In radio, there are no barriers either. Right. Think about Howard. Like my wife loves Howard Stern. And she's like, Howard this and Howard that. It's like Howard. It's like Howard is not your friend. Yeah. But, you know, it feels that's that the way. connection. Yeah. And this has changed dramatically because of mobile, the business itself, you know, the, the usage and the views. I mean, it seemed like it was really hard for people to tune into these shows and figure out how to subscribe to a podcast. I mean, let's face it, podcasting was a very niche thing. But Here's now that I, you have YouTube and TuneIn and Stitcher, I feel like the audience is sort of just making a huge level up. I think you have, there's two different things that you're getting out there. Um, and I'll take one first, because I've been thinking a lot about this. We just bring up the term mobile. Hmm. Because I think YouTube sits in a different space, although it intersects like those Venn diagrams from school. Um, but if you think about mobile, a lot of people lump mobile tablets and phones into mobile, where they're very different experiences. If you think about a phone as something, phone you carry around with you all the time, you're using it to seek and search out and little snippets of things you may get. A tablet, to me tablets are as revolutionary to television and video as TiVo was. Because a tablet is like a paperback television. Mm. It's a personal television. Think about right. it. Think about, so here's a really good example is, um, think about uh, the Kindle, right? Mm. One of the biggest books of 2012 and still is, is Fifty Shades of Grey. Right. I mean, it's porn. Right. right. Oh, Let's yeah. face it. And before the fact, you could read it on a Kindle. On a Kindle, no one knows what you're reading. Right. I mean, you could be reading, you know, you could be reading War and Peace or Fifty Shades of Grey, and nobody knows. Right. In the old days of books, they would have a book cover. You'd have like the bodice ripper, and you know, somebody would be showing half their nipples or something. Yeah. And Fabio. Right. Whatever. And nobody wants to be associated with that. I think you see the same thing with tablets and uh -huh. and watching videos. It's very much of a personal guilty pleasure. You can watch whatever you want. It's not like it's on a big screen TV and somebody in your family wanted to is like, what the heck are you watching? Instead, right. it's like it's just sitting there in your lap. Right. And it's, I also think it's a much more intimate experience because you're holding it in your hand. Yeah. I and call it the curl up. 
Yeah, not the did, lean back. Right, you were saying that the curl up. That was really up. smart. Yeah. Really smart. Um, it's because it because it, by naming it that way, you really made it. You made people think of it as a different product and a different experience. Right. And uh, it is. It, it is, is totally is. So that's the mobile thing. But I think on the YouTube side, YouTube's Twitter, et cetera, we're just getting better at surfacing things that people might like and getting better at helping them to subscribe to it so that they can then watch it multiple times. You see the new YouTube interface, right? Yeah, explain it. Um, really what they've done is, um, amongst everything else they're putting, all the, everything you subscribe to now lives in a persistent left nav on the screen so that everywhere you go on YouTube, there's always the left nav of the people you've subscribed to and their latest things. And that will go on mobile, it'll go on smart TVs, it'll go everywhere beyond just the PC. The yeah, I noticed that it's on the mobile and it's also on the tablet already. And I haven't seen it because I just got my new Samsung TV. Like literally, I buy a new Samsung every six or 12 months for the office. And it didn't have the same interface yet. I guess that, that's going to be the last one to, to Yeah, fall. interesting. I mean, I, I, I think um, YouTube has taken over control of their apps on all these platforms. Mm -hmm. It'll probably get, They haven't rolled it out on YouTube.com on the PCs or Macs yet. Mm -hmm. On the browser side, some of the channels have it. Like if you look at... Uh, rated, I Justine has it. I Justine, Rated RR, one of the guys we yeah. work with has it. And I saw Justine's stuff. It's gradually getting rolled out. Yeah. The homepage has it. The permalink pages have it. Do you guys have it on any of your We haven't channels moved yet? our channels to it, but because we're a partner, they, I think they gave us the ability to do it, but yeah. I think it's going to roll out to everybody in the weeks to follow the airing of this well, program. Well, you know, you know what the important thing to do is on that, by the way, is the welcome video. Yes, which is we're awesome. now cutting. I know we now we you know yeah. stupid us. Like explain we, what it is because we're okay, talking so shop here. Basically, it's a promo. So cut a 15, 30 minute long promo that talks about your channel. It used to be. If you went to uh, any, you know, a channel, you would go to that channel page and on YouTube, you would, on yeah. YouTube, sorry, and you would yeah. see whatever video the owner of that happened to put up, and it was probably the latest video in most cases or the biggest one. Um, now you get a promo video, and so you go to that channel and you gotta you gotta cut a really good promo that'll entice people to, to subscribe, because the 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 YouTube. Um, the, the sort of the currency of YouTube is now about subscriptions. And why is that? What, what, the young because people, the subscriptions show up in the left hand uh, nav gotcha, that right. goes everywhere with you, and, and that's, that's how the, you get people to watch. In a way, it's like the new DVR, isn't it? Because it shows you the number of shows. This is what I thought was particularly yeah. interesting about it is it'll say like this week in startups two, or you know Epic Meal Time three, or you know Tosh two. You or, know what it looks a little like? What email? Look iTunes. It is like, like iTunes, iTunes with podcasts. iTunes with they podcasts. They kind of borrowed a fair bit of... Yeah. Uh, or you, email, like or, folders. Yeah, right, exactly. But I love the fact that you can like clear out your videos. Like It's almost like getting to inbox zero. It's getting to right. YouTube zero. Right. I'm going to just get through my videos. And, you know, like, I don't yeah, know if totally. you've had that experience on your DVR where you're like, oh, I'm too behind well, on I still use show. Speed Demon to read all my stuff in RSS. You know, and, oh, my God. And this is how I... You are my, old school. <laughs> well, but it's great because this is how I read all the blogs and everything I travel. Every time it goes, I was like, you've got 5,700 unread stuff. Would you Ugh. like to make them all read? And sometimes I'm like, yes. Yes. <laughs> Feed reader zero. Um, we do kind of keep ourselves busy. So advertising, though, is starting to happen in a big way that it didn't in 2006, 2007 when you guys were starting, hasn't it? Well, what we're seeing, um, and I think in many ways, we just have to live with it, whether I think it's a mistake or not, or right or wrong, we're starting to treat online video as if it was an extension of television from an advertising perspective. So there's a lot of sense of how they measure television, GRP or gross rating points. And basically it's some, it's just a measure of how many people are watching. We're starting to see that come into web video, which I think is wrong because I think web video in many ways is a different medium. But the good part about it is we're actually using methodology. This gets back to counting that is very similar to the way television does it, which makes somebody who buys television ads much more likely to put ads of a similar type on web video. So that's led to a bunch of money coming into web video. Right, but it's been not even close to the consumption level. So not at all. what is it, like 40 or 50% of video is now watched online, but only one or 2% of the advertising has shifted over. Why is that? It's, it happens with every new medium. Remember it happened with the web. Yeah, it did. Remember you were probably complaining about it with Silicon Alley? Of and course I we was. We were like, yeah. my God, you're putting all those ads in PC Magazine. I've got a bigger audience. Why aren't you advertising on my website? Come <laughs> on, we were all saying that at the time, yeah. right? Sometimes I have to ask questions I know the answer to. It's, right, not, but, the, it's but, not, you're the guest. But, <laughs> I'm the interviewer. But, no, 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 but seriously, yes. right? I mean, it, new media. When do, when do, okay, so let me ask so another So when way. do you cross it? Yeah, when, when, when do we catch up? That's when do we get halfway question. there? I mean, why? What's taking so long? Um, or, is it, or is it moving at a okay, nice pace Okay, I'll tell you, what's, you what's taking so long. One, 
is we've all been, it's been really difficult for us to count the size of our audiences in a way that's consistent where we can go back to an advertiser and say, here's how big it is. Two, we're not very good yet as an industry in proving the ROI of their investments in our media. If yeah. I am an ad buyer, it's really easy for me to go out and buy Discovery Channel all day long and then go have drinks. It's really difficult for me to put together a plan with online video that will deliver results that I can go back to my client and say, look at these results I delivered for you. It's a, it's, we are too, still too hard to buy. Yeah, still too hard to buy. But you can do things online that you cannot do on TV. Absolutely. And the metrics on TV, I mean, let's face it. They're a li I mean, I know you work for Discovery now, so you can't go trash it, but it is a little fugazi how they measure stuff, right? Like these sample sizes. The way you measure on television is totally, um, totally uh, foobar. Yeah. I didn't want to use your little. No, it's okay. You swear, swear jar. jar. It's okay. Ten no, bucks. No, no, you can no, no. I'm not. I don't. I don't swear anyway. But yeah. I was going to say. Uh, the, yeah, no. It's it's effed it's up beyond up. repair. Yeah. It's screwed up. Um, but the, the it, it the thing is, it's a fiction that everybody believes in. Mm. So with Nielsen, everybody believes that this is the way it is, mm -hmm. and everybody plays by the same rules. Yeah. We don't even have the same set of rules across everything. Yeah. That's the problem. But it's getting there. Feels like. The other thing we don't really understand is. You know, traditional advertising has a um, an OTS measure, an opportunity to see, an OTV. And so the example is, um, let's the reason why, and if you watch football or sports or anything, you see the same darn Budweiser ad 50 times. Right. Because they don't know if you've gotten up to go to the bathroom. Yeah. They want to make sure, that they've got to run that ad against their target sample a certain number of times to make it statistically significant that they will hit the right amount of people to make it worth their investment. It's an opportunity to view or an opportunity to see. Yeah. Billboards, put a billboard ad up on a uh, freeway. I wanna reach X number of people. Well, you pass by that same billboard 20 times in a month, you had 20 opportunities to see. Right. We don't even know what the right opportunity to see quotient is on web video. Right. I've been thinking a lot about this and, uh, and putting some plans together. We know, so for the revision three across all of our shows, um, and this is according to Comscore, and you know, Comscore is a fiction that um, we all believe, or many of us yeah. believe. Um, our uniques to overall video views is about a one to four ratio. So mm -hmm. um, we have X uniques and X times four overall views. So I'm putting together plans where on an individual channel level, someone's saying, well, if you're gonna give me a million impressions, how many, uniques do you, how many unique people am I reaching? And I'm like, well, we don't have the reporting to go down to that level, but I can take the math that we all agree on Comscore and apply it over here. Yeah. I don't know if that's valid or not, but it's a heck of a lot more valid than just saying, um, just believe me because I'm... Well, we can also track that people then bought something or signed up for an email. I mean, that does seem to be a big, big benefit that we have over... Right, that works for certain media. things, but it doesn't work for, for example, Ford. And we've done a yeah. lot of stuff with Ford. You have, and yeah. no one's going to put a code in and buy a Fiesta, right? Yeah. But Fortunately, you have to go through a dealer, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Bring this code. Yeah. Used revision 3, 7. Yeah, right, exactly. Use Veronica 15 and get 15% off your next... <laughs> next Fiesta. Your next Fiesta. Uh, throw out your current Fiesta and buy yeah. a new Fiesta. Right. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. This interview is going great, and I wanted to take a moment to thank my friends at ShareFile by Citrix. Uh, why ShareFile? Large att attachments bouncing back. That's a waste of your time. Dropping files into online boxes that are not secure, pretty dangerous. Don't do it. And uh, with ShareFile, you can easily, easily send files of almost any size. I'm talking about really big ones. And access those files from any computer or mobile device. It's safe and secure. It's built for business. This is industrial strength file sharing and control. You can track the progress of your files. You can control who has access with them to those individual files with password protections. And you can even sign in and edit the files for streamlined collaboration. We use it at this weekend launch. Like when we have to request files, we say, hey, you know, whether you're using this file service or not, I can just request a file from you and then you drop it into a uh, share file and we get it. We get email alerts when somebody uploads or downloads those files. Uh, and then we share really big, large video clips with our um, partners uh, for the show. Like if somebody wants a clip from the show that's really, you know, too large to just put in other services. So sign up for your free 30 day trial today. Yes, sign up for your free 30 day trial today. Visit sharefile.com, click on the radio microphone button and use the promo code TWIST. Sharefile.com, radio microphone button. Promo code TWIST. You know what to do. 30-day free trial, no credit card required. And that really shows uh, that Citrix is very confident in the ShareFile product. And we've been using it uh, daily at the, at the program. And it's a really great product. Really check it out. It's got a lot of power user features. And it's very business and secure, uh, designed for security and for business. Thanks so much to my friends at ShareFile. Let's get back to the program.
but some of the stuff that we do there uh, is around um, this. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, we show a lot of social lift, um, mm -hmm. but we do pre and post studies. I mean, apart how you show ROI, if someone's gonna spend enough money with us, yeah. we'll do it. We'll survey our audience beforehand. Huh. Survey them afterwards. Interesting. Have, hopefully, have some statistical uh, significance in there. Sure. I was a math major, so I understand a little bit of that. Um, and we know what their key characteristics and criteria are, and then we show we move the needle. Mm. Again, it's very intensive and hands-on. It's not cheap to do, but you kind of have to do that to show that ROI. And because it's not easy, that's another reason why the money has not flown in as much as it as it will. Right. And uh, you guys were part of the YouTube-funded um, program, I believe? We were on the second round. The second round. We did round. not do the first round. Which I think was us, too. I think we're, yeah. Mahalo was in this sort of second uh, group. Yeah, we launched in October. Oh, um, yeah, we did the same thing, right? Yeah. We, I think we launched, we, we had a stagger launch, August, September, October, November. So how many shows did you do with them? Explain to the audience what that program was, and how do you look at YouTube sure. funding original programming? Sure. Because that was a watershed moment, was it not? Yeah, well, so YouTube, wanna, and look, take a step back. Why did YouTube put $100 million and then another hundred million in, or however much it was. What I'll, I'll tell you what they did, and then I, why I think they did it, yep. um, and why I think it was super successful. So um, a lot of great content on YouTube, but not a lot of great content on YouTube um, about two years ago from anybody that um, media people would know, anybody that advertisers would know. Got it. Uh, look, I love, I mean, Shay Carl and Justine and all these guys, I, mean, I think they're brilliant. But if you walk into BBD and O, they're like, what, who? Yeah. So YouTube said, look, we're going to fund a bunch of channels. We're going to do, we're going to go out to major media companies and we're going to go out to people who've built television programming and magazine publishers and say, we'll give you a million dollars, two million dollars, five million dollars, ten million dollars, launch a series of shows with your brand hmm. and then we're going to go out to sell it. The goal for them, I believe, was at the time they were getting a very small um, CPM, yield per view of, you know, in the two or three dollar range. Uh, after doing this, they increased... They, they turned YouTube from, a, from the public perception of YouTube was funny cat videos, cats riding skateboards. And then, after a year of putting this money in, it became, wow, there's quality content that's worthy of advertising dollars on YouTube, along with cats riding skateboards, of course. Sure, it's both. So it really helped get the yield per view up for their premium content. Right. So that's what they did, and that's why I think they did it. Now, they funded, I guess, 100 channels or something like that. On um, that first round, dropped 100 million in or whatever the number was. They only renewed about 30%. Right. So Which seems to be about the right number. Like, I mean, why would you invest in the bottom third or bottom half or whatever? I mean, they must have a model where they're looking at it saying, well, these people didn't get it, and they didn't get subscribers, and they didn't get views, and the audience they react to. So why don't we double down or triple down with the people on top? Well, and do that and then fund some new folks. So what they did with the next yeah. round that you and I were part of, yeah. most of that money went to Europe. Right, that's true, yeah. And because I think they, they faced the same issue in Europe where – their average yield per view is down, hmm. and they wanted to go out and get quality content in Europe and fund it so that advertisers in Europe would look at YouTube as a place for quality content, you know, a safe place to put right. your advertising. Um, How much of so, it is consistency, too? Because, you know, when you think about it, I think one of the big revolutions with Leo Laporte and This Week in Tech and Revision 3 and Indignation was consistency of publishing. I mean, everybody started a podcast in 2004, 2005. Everybody thought they could do it. But then it got to week five or six or seven, and everybody's podcast seemed to go away. Then they would come back in a flurry and do three episodes, and they'd go you away for another great, six months. You wrote a great piece about this. I did? Oh, yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> it, was, it, it was about growing when you were talking about, um, actually, when you were talking about shutting down this weekend. Oh, ah, yeah. And when you were talking about how the things that were working. Right. And putting in four years without really, you know, without, with, with not knowing that there would be a return, but doing it every week. And I caught, you know, when we start something, yeah. we start on a schedule and we never stop. Right. It's funny, I go on like, television now, Discovery, yeah. they do things in 13 week episodes, right? Or 13 episodes, or 26 episodes, and they stop. Yeah, take a break. And then they pick it up a year later. Right. We're like, no, we're on the hamster trail. I mean, we have to feed the content monster every week. Yeah, you maybe can put out a compilation best of for two and, weeks a year. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story about how we learned this. It's a great, I mean, just fantastic show early on called Epic Foo. Yep. Uh, and it was a Jet Set show before that. Yeah. So Zadi, Zadi and Steve, Zadi. Zadi. Uh, Steve Wolf, Zadi Diaz, awesome shows on Next New Networks. It was great. They did an awesome job. It took a two or three month break. Yeah. And we brought them on to Revision 3. And we were super psyched. So we're like, this guy's are great. We were just getting into YouTube. We we're like, this is going to be awesome. Never really got back to that same level because no matter how wonderful it was, hmm. the audience had moved on. Yeah. And so 
it's almost like we the such the, the the online web viewing audience is so ADD that if you're not in their face on the subscription bar on the left every minute of the day yeah. every week they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean the problem for me was I just think long form like we're doing here or Leo does or I'm trying to think of who else does long form. Well, so I think long form is just so much harder. Like the half hour engaging hour long. people. Well, I I I agree to do it well yeah. is much harder. We were lucky to uh, when we um, came into Discovery, the How Stuff Works guys um, have a great stuff ah, yes. you should know. Right, that's Josh like and Chuck. five ten minutes or no no no, it's an hour long. Is it? It's oh, an well, that's audio the TV podcast. Show. Oh, the audio podcast. They do an audio podcast that's an hour long. Don't they also have some like three or four or five? They minute do. Videos? They do some. Short, we're doing doing more short form stuff yeah, with them. Yeah, I've seen short. Form. But the hour long audio podcast. And they use PodTrack, so we know. Right. A couple hundred thousand people listen every week. Wow. Similar to what you, know, what you have and what Leo has, is they have this engaged audience yeah. that will grab it. And I don't know how people, you know, I don't know how you're all listening or watching, but I would guarantee a lot of you have it running in the background while you're doing other things. Of course. You don't want to look at us. Who wants to do work? You, Nobody wants to look at us. The video is like, I don't even know why we do video because everybody tells, I don't no, know I'll why. Know, I'll tell you why you do video. Is it advertisers? Or? Yeah, because, well, because you can get a higher... Higher CPM. It just feels to me, video. yeah. It's just like everybody is. Every. I mean, I like doing video. There are moments when I can put my computer on the screen and show something. Nope. So it does. It does add value. But the truth is, I think you're right. Everybody puts it in a tab. They go back to work. The boss doesn't want to see them watching video at work, but so, they're listening to the audio in the background. I, they, I have to tell you the funniest picture I ever saw um, in this world. So you know, doing Dignation for song. We knew a lot sure. of people just listen to Dignation. I mean, yep. we had. But some guy took a picture of himself. Actually, he was driving. He took a picture of his dashboard, speedometer, controls, phone right here, or his portable media player at the time, showing Dignation. I'm like, right. you're driving. Don't I look down. I hope you're not watching that. Yeah, I hope that's not the but, moment where like they're chugging <laughs> or smacking each other's beer bottles off the top and making them explode because you're going to look down. You're going to look down at that and then you're yeah. going to get it. But yeah, but he's probably driving on. Hey, self-driving cars are going to add another like, can you think about all A the lot more viewers for us. A lot Yay. more viewers is going to be awesome. That's awesome. Project it right onto the screen. When's your Tesla going to be self-driving? I think, this is what I think, I think Apple and Google are going to make a run at Tesla in the next 24 months. I'm going to write a blog post about this. Oh, interesting. And I, well, because think about, this is what, Apple, this is how, well, the Apple's an interesting one. Well, here's the thing. Steve Jobs said he wanted to do a car. When you get a car, like the Tesla Model S, where there's an iPad in the middle, and they're getting over-the-air software updates, it's a different experience. Yeah. In that, my car, I get a new car every 30 days. It's you know like when you bought the Mercedes this year and last year's Mercedes didn't have the SD card you could plug in or didn't have um, you know voice controls and you're like oh which year do you have your Prius right. like, oh you don't have that feature yet buy a new Prius to get the feature it's like what now it's like they just added like oh well, let's add traffic to Google Maps so like the second update had traffic then they're like oh yeah we've got to put satellites on there. let's put satellites on there they're putting turn by turn navigation they just keep adding stuff have they added ways in yet they haven't I I told Nalan to buy ways yeah um, but I think ways is too expensive but I think Google has ways data yeah they'll, they'll, they ways, they'll, anyway, they'll put yeah. ways in the this is what they do they put ways in the dashboard as an app and you'll buy it for ten bucks right and so now they're gonna have a revenue model and that's just to me like Google has self driving cars think about it is Google gonna be able to convince Toyota and Ford to use their self-driving technology? Maybe, maybe not. Those, and those guys are so slow to adopt. So what they should do is, I think Google should just buy the buy Tesla, and then they'll get those self-driving cars right. in market two or three years before anybody else would. And they'll put the fire to the feet of the other auto ma people because they're not going to be able to compete. You know, they should have bought Saab. I'm a, I'm a frustrated Saab owner. So. Oh, I used to love Saabs. I never owned one, but I love them. Yeah. Um, so tell me, you sold the company, and you're part of... Um, part of Discovery. Discovery. Were you guys too early to make it a sustainable business? I think, I, yeah. yeah. Look, I, when I look back at it, and uh, with Cloud, we were, you know, we thought we were right on time. We were too early. I mean, you look at... How many years too early were you? Three or four. Okay. If you look at Maker, Machinima, I mean, us, Next New Networks... Um, you know, we were all around the same time, a couple mm. of other people as well. Uh, and you saw, we all saw. Mevio. <laughs> Mevio. Yeah. I mean, they're still out there somewhere. Yeah. Um, they changed their name to something else. They keep changing it. Um, but we were too early. Mm. Um, because, and I'll say why, and this is a great lesson for startups, is, you know, we raised a bunch of cash, and I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but, you know, we, we went out after the opportunity. By the time the real opportunity had come up, you know, mm. YouTube was starting to grow, we saw some of these early network startups up. We didn't have enough cash to really go after it and take advantage of it. Ah. And I, you know, you used I up wished, all your ammunition. Yes, and my powder was not dry enough. <laughs> so, but that's, um, I think, 
You know, the good news is we built a strong enough company that somebody wanted to buy and that we're doing great things for them. The flip side of it is you look at uh, the companies now that are similar to what we were, Maker and Machinima and Full Screen and Big Frame. Those guys are going to have big exits. They're going to do great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those companies are worth two or $300 million yep. right now. They're raising, I think Machinima raised, not Machinima. Um, Maker just raised, raised 40 from Time Warner. 40 from a bunch of people, including Time Warner. And yeah. I think that was at a $200 million valuation yeah, something or something like that. crazy. So Same amazing. thing with like Google just just dropped a bunch of money into Machinima. Right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, anyway, it's so those guys have, are building good companies. Look at um, full screen. I mean, full screen's doing great. Hmm. They're, um, they built a somewhat different model, but the, apparently they're, you know, Last I heard, which is a year or two ago, they were you know, profitable already. So, and what's the right model? Is the right model to build a network like Machinima has done and Maker has done, or to create original shows like my company, Inside.com, uh, and uh, I guess Fullscreen does their own all original program where they represent. No, Fullscreen represents. Full, full so screen's representing, right? Fullscreen does technology uh -huh. and um, assistance, and they also have a broad network of. Uh, they have a long tail network. Ah, uh. right. What? Um, uh, full screen and machinima have kind of a midtail network with some top stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think things are changing. Mm. Um, frankly, I think that doing, I think the owned and, the, the owned and operated model more and more will be the way to go. Oh, good, I'm making the right decision. Uh, so <laughs> I think you're I think you're on the right track. Because last year I was like, I think that this is o why is that? Because I because could, no. because um, there is not enough money to go around for everybody who wants to squeeze pieces out of what's there. Done intelligently, it's good, mm. um, and but it's going to be hard because look, YouTube is a great platform. They want to make money. Mm -hmm. um, creators want to make money. Um, it, it's a real margin business, and I think it's hard to ride them. It will be harder over time to ride those margins. Yeah, to well, I heard that some of the networks are offering like over a hundred percent to the artist. So, in other words. You're making this amount. We'll guarantee you 110 percent of that amount, 120 percent of that amount, to get them to sign up for their networks. But then other people told me these networks are really about getting all of these, you know, unsuspecting YouTubers to give you their traffic so that you can go raise money from somebody it in used a big to be valuation. That way. I think those and days are over. You can redirect the traffic to your owned and operated property. Well, look, that's the, that's the negative stuff I heard, probably from people who are bitter. Well, having they, not been represented properly. But there's a little bit of that. As a, I mean, there was a lot of, of that out there early on, I think yeah. less and less now. Um, certainly the interesting thing about bringing somebody in, it's all just math, right? Mm. If, if you're doing a million views a month, and, and I think that if I bring you into the network and I can um, bring in sort of cross-promotional capabilities and annotation capabilities that will drive traffic and I can assign a value to that, and it makes sense mathematically, you know, maybe there's a model of paying someone 110%, hmm. but you've got to make sure you get something for it. But I still think margins will be squeezed and it's hard. It's going to be hard to make money on the margin. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a lot of value in owning your own content, your own audiences. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a swing. I think we're seeing a gradual trend towards that, but we'll see. I mean, it, it could go the other way. And, and well, it's all about monetization as well, because if you believe that the yield per view, if I, let's say, let me give you a perfect example. Yeah. Um, I sign you up to a three-year deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're making um, a $3 CPM right now. Okay. I say I'll give you 330 mm. for three years. I can bet on the com too, you know? Right. right? So because you know it's going because maybe it's going to go up to six bucks and yeah. maybe by by uh, in nine months in, in eighteen months it'll be six bucks and now I'm making bank. You're free on rolling. It. Yeah, so you can bet that way too. Interesting. Um, let's talk about production budgets and what people are spending. What did you spend per minute of programming in the early days? Where is it at now, and where do you think it's going? Now, and especially now that you're inside of Discovery, where Gosh, you know, looking at the quality of program they're doing, I'm guessing they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a minute, or not tens that of, much a minute. Tens of thousands. It's tens of thousands of dollars a minute. So, what, where did well, you guys start? Where did you guys end up? So we're we're pretty much where we started. I mean, it it um, although our stuff's a little bit shorter, so it's a little bit more expensive. We're in the we were in the hundred to two hundred dollar a minute range. Yeah. Um, you know, as Dignation got more and more profitable uh, and bigger and bigger, you know, we ended up sharing more of that revenue with the creators, which you know sure. you want to do. That was the deal. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that made the cost go up. Right. But you know, roughly in the hundred or two hundred dollar range a minute, we we can push on some of our stuff a little closer to three hundred, mm -hmm. but not much more than that. I think this but, is for talk show style. Yeah, stuff. we're still doing hosted talk show oriented. If you look at some of the scripted stuff that's going on, and um, I don't know if you follow the video game High School 
Yeah, uh, high school. And, that was yeah. five thousand a minute. Yeah, I, I did the math on it. I, it was in the three to five thousand dollars. It was a five. I did it. I had Freddie W. by here, and I just had lunch with him. Um, and I, I did the back because he, he posted that great infographic. No, I know, I, right? Six hundred thousand dollars. I said, how many minutes did you do? And he said, oh, we did like this many minutes. And I was like. So I rolled in the behind the scenes stuff into my minute cost. Oh, okay. So, it's probably so that's three. why I brought it down. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was the same thing. Three to five thousand dollars a minute. Right. And which still, given the fact that he's doing all that, uh, what do they call the special effects? Those scenes. Yeah. The, the, the 3D special effects. effects. Yeah. yeah. 3D effects. So he's doing all those effects. I mean, that's still F ridiculously low. Yeah. FX, yeah. Well, and, but if you look at the way that he costs it out, it's really interesting because there are holes in there. I wrote this and I still haven't published my column because, and um, but I will at some point. Um, but they spent very little on talent. So ah. talent was a very small fraction. People are working uh, just for, for the friend, credit. Their friends and credits. Yeah, they're but, doing it for credit. But that's not going to last forever. Um, mm -hmm. They also, on pre-pro, they spent very little on pre-pro compared to what you would do pre-production yeah. on what you would do uh, in a normal production. So Of that magnitude. Of that magnitude. So, yeah. you know, in the end, they spent 630000 630, somewhere around there. Um, raised a couple hundred thousand on Kickstarter. You know, they, they ended up, because probably making money, they brought in sponsors. But they probably ended up Spending closer to eight hundred, um, wow. if you think about the in-kind value of what they received. Now they just raised eight hundred plus thousand for the next version, right? Of on video Kickstarter. game high school yeah. on Kickstarter, which he's pretty said he wants it to be the Harry Potter of, uh, which I'm psyched to see. Right. It's a it's a good show. Have it's you really guys tried show. Kickstarter for a project, or you just think that? Not yet. We may. Yeah. I mean, if we were still independent, I would totally do it. Yeah, I've been thinking right? about it. Yeah. Why not? Sure. Um, but make sure it's something that you that. That you, you know, wouldn't do normally, and it's got a lot of sizzle. I mean, make it something amazing. I it's got to be something amazing. You're Jason. You can make amazing things happen. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you have I, to come up with that idea. I kinda, I'm also tired. You know, like I, I like doing my show. Yeah. This is the thing. You know, I think when you get older and you're doing and you're doing one of these shows, you kind of click into like what you want to do. Like I like to sit here and have a conversation with another entrepreneur or founder or maybe a VC sometimes. Yeah. And I want to do it for 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half. I, I don't want to go, like, come up with something and ask people to pay for it. It's not my not interest. Well, but do it under one of the auspices oh, of the companies you're doing. Yeah, do it under Insider. Do it would, under, uh, you Yeah, know. we might do that. You have to find a very powerful idea, though. I think you're right. Or do another event and kickstart it, right? Yeah. Think of that cool event that you always wanted to do and you didn't know if there would be an audience. That's a good point. You know what? I, and uh, I was talking. That's to, a good idea. I'm gonna, you know, take a note, somebody, Bryce. Take a note. We should come up with an event and then email everybody and say, do, if you want to do it, put in some put money. Put in hundred bucks or fifty bucks, and yeah. you'll get. We'll crowdsource front row seats or five hundred bucks. Yeah, you know, that sort of thing. I like that. Now here's the, the so the other area where I think Kickstarter could be really cool, and I I mentioned this to the YouTube guys. Um, you know, they're 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 talking about doing subscription channels, right? Mm. So what I really want to do is I want them to make Kickstarter for subscription channels to say, I will go cover um, the Tick uh, Festival in Heaney, Colorado. So if genius. I can raise enough money and then only the people who put in go into that subscription. So, so it's like a, it's a subscription inside a subscription. Exactly. But you could pop up a channel to do that, but it would be easier if that was seamless. It was all seamless, exactly. Oh, that'd be so great if you could say, on a per episode basis, here are the 10 people I want to interview. For the show. So I right. want to interview Masa in uh, Japan. It's going to cost $20,000 to do that. I want to interview this person in London. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost 15000 to do that. It's going to cost 10000 to interview this person. And if it hits that threshold of donations, then I'll we charge you. It. And right. then I'll go do it. Right. Like Kevin could do that with Foundation or whatever. Totally. That's a great idea. Yeah. Is you, are YouTube subscriptions going to work, you think? I have no idea. I don't know. My, I, I, I only know what I've read about. I mean, it's mm. coming out. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's, you know what I like about the Do idea? Do you have any fan subscriptions or have you tried right it? We don't now. Have you ever tried it? Well, we did the Dignation thing I talked about early right. on, but. That was like we, a, that's like a donation, yeah. That was a donation, exactly. Yeah. It was a tip jar. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we've talked about it. I mean, like, we are, we want to explore alternate revenue. We haven't done anything yet, mm -hmm. but um, Discovery's been really good at, you know, Discovery, the, the, one of the nice things about coming to a big company like Discovery was they had people in there doing things. That we were doing so much better than we were, like on digital distribution. Right. There's a group of people that do digital distribution discovery who are, you do not want to be on the other side of the desk from them. I'm so yeah. glad they're on my side. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I cut my distribution group and I was like, you guys handle it. Yeah. And these are the ones who did the deal with Netflix and did the deal, you know, they, so they are making money that way. Mm. So we're talking so about. So they're already doing in discussions with Netflix over the. 500 different shark episodes they have. They're already up there. And they're already up there, I noticed. A lot of Discovery content. Yeah. So then they can just say, hey, do you want some Revision 3 stuff? And they're negotiating that for you? No, no, we haven't or done that. We haven't shows. done that. They don't really want our stuff. Oh. Um, no, it's no, why doesn't Netflix want shows like ours? Because they're on the internet for free. 
So if I, what if I said to Netflix, I'll put my archives only on Netflix? Do you think they would be interested? Would they pay me? I don't. I, I think, and I don't have any solid knowledge on this. I don't think that that's a conversation they're even willing to have for a couple of years. Hmm. Because why? Because they perceive some difference in quality? No, because I think or, they've got too much else going on. Because ah, they've got, you know, they've got to do more things like um, House of Cards. Mm -hmm. They're big international. They're doing all their international expansion. I just, you look at a company like low that. Low-hanging fruit. It's, it's not low-hanging fruit. Yeah, they, it's too difficult. I mean, too long tail. And, and, and uh, how, how do your archives do? People yeah. grab, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the show is, I, I got to say the YouTube thing, I think is the thing that's really starting to grow. Because I, what I started doing is I started logging into YouTube, you know, my account, my Google Plus account. Right. Which has like 600,000 followers nice. somehow. And I'm interacting with people in the show. And what I realized about YouTube is when I post a comment to them, they get an email. And like some of these YouTubers check their emails and then they instantly respond. Oh, cool. So now like those really stupid comments on YouTube are getting pushed down and the intelligent threads are going. So now what I do is I answer somebody. Somebody says, oh, this is a great interview with Chervin. And then I'm like, yeah, that was great. What was your favorite moment? And then a day later or 12 hours later, they put their favorite moment. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a great moment. My favorite moment was this. Have you seen this episode? And so I always end it with a question. Right, and now right. I'm starting and to get going, like, oh, there's oh, something intelligent really going on in the yeah. comments. And it brings people back to the show. Well, and the, the integration, I think, for all the stuff that YouTube is doing, and I love that they're experimenting and trying new stuff. Yeah. The integration of Google Plus, as they do more and more of that, to me, yeah, that my is understanding so smart. is Google, your Google Plus identity and the YouTube identity will sort of become one thing. I think is sort of the goal. I've kind of heard those rumors too. I mean, yeah. it makes sense to me. Well, it would be great because then it's like, well, if I have a channel called something, you know, it'd be like, well, okay, now it's Jason Calacanis is this week in startup, right. and it, it really is the same identity, right? So like. Then I could be. Con it just seems like it would make more sense, um, and it is a social network. YouTube it's, is a better YouTube, social network or bigger one than Google Plus. I heard it's the third biggest, and I don't know where the stat comes from, so don't hold me to it. The third biggest social network out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. I mean, even if you just think about it, I have 800 million people a month using it, and if five percent were involved in social activities, or just five percent, that would be 40 million That's people. Huge. It's pretty it's huge. huge. And if it was 10 percent, it would be big. Like big, big. So it's Facebook. Is, do you, is Twitter a social network? I, I still don't even know if it I is think or it not. Is. I think do people kind of call so it that? So what? Why did Discovery buy Revision Three? What was the? I mean, so everybody's got to have a thesis. So here's the th here's the thesis and yeah. the rationale. Discovery was number one in nonfiction video, um, nonfiction video on linear, right? Worldwide. Mm -hmm. Discovery is very much a worldwide company. And um, why? Why is it? I mean, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you see if you know because I heard a speech from your CEO at, at Van Allen Company at the conference. Oh, cool. What is the reason why it's so international or so easy? What is their advantage? Uh, well, the reason, well, I'm not sure. The, the, the reason why it's... There's a secret why it's so international. Okay, well, maybe you can tell me because you know the answer. But the, okay. I will tell you the reason why yeah. is, well, they started thinking about this 17 years ago, but it's yeah. very, I mean, it's great visual content that people want to watch. Yeah, you, got, you basically got, here's the thing. Th this was the most brilliant thing I heard from. What's the CEO's name? Uh, David Zaslav. Yeah, so I saw David speak, and he's like, when MTV went global, they needed to do a localized version of the real world. And when they went to Spain, they needed to do another one. And when they went to Italy, the people in Italy didn't want to see Spain, they wanted to see Italy. So they had to pop up production. When we do Shark Week, and we do Great White Sharks, all we have to do is subtitle it. Yep. We don't have to do a local version of Sharks for Italy and Spain and for Japan. Now and that's, that's why it was just like, boom, just international. That's true. But I will also say that um, many of the arrangements in the local countries require a certain percentage of international, of, of localized of local, content. Yes, of course. And I think that's growing. I mean, we ran into this when we did Tech TV Canada. Yeah. It was like 70% or 30%. I forget the percentage. But we had to do, this is why Leo went up to Vancouver every couple of weeks to do Call for Help Canada. Really? And it's also why after Tech TV was gone, uh -huh. he still did Call for Help Canada. Really? Yeah. He still would go to Vancouver and do Call for Help Canada. Because they just wanted to have Canadian... Canadian local content. Wow. Yeah. So they're just like, hey, we're just going to keep paying you we're for just, this. We're just going to fly Leo up to so do the So their thesis was, their number one... I'm, I cut you off. The no, no, thesis, that's fine. That's the, cool. What was the thesis? Let's go back to that. So yeah, so the thesis was, we're number one linear nonfiction mm -hmm. uh, in television. We went uh, you know, to 100 million homes in the U.S., to a billion homes worldwide. Um, and we built, you know, although I didn't describe it this way because I wasn't smart enough, you know, arguably um, the top n sort of nonfiction web original company. I would say so, yes. And, and uh, I mean, so, Net, Next New Networks was probably. Yeah, but they were off the table at the time. But they, they, they were sort of like a very short lived. 
yeah. you guys sustained twice so, as long. Right. So we were, you know, number one um, nonfiction web original. And the goal was to merge us together and to keep going, by the way, but to build the number one nonfiction video company across all screens. So 100 million US, billion worldwide, 100 billion screens over the mm -hmm. next couple of years. We want to be the number one nonfiction video company across all of them. Every glowing rectangle in your life, Does that everywhere mean in the world. They will take shows they're doing and give them to you to do online or no, are they are they are you guys coming up with new show ideas that will go online to to go upstream? No, because they know how to make really good television. Right, they don't We're not you. good at that. Yeah. You know, they bought into the sort of the vision of this is a new medium. Mm -hmm. And w w the thing that's confusing about um, digital distribution of video on the internet is it is both a new medium and a distribution mechanism for the old medium. And it, they tend to get confused, right? Mm -hmm. So you take traditional television. We have digital cable, and now you can take those same shows and put them on Netflix and Hulu um, and Amazon Prime. They're essentially the same old medium, just distributed in a new way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's new consumption models coming out because people are binge viewing uh, and you know watching 100 episodes but the, over But the weekend. product is the same. product's the same. But then there's the ability to do things like what you're doing now. What you're doing and we're doing right now could not be done on traditional television. No. But you can find an audience that's strong enough and passionate enough sure. and will watch this and will make it profitable. Yeah, so, Yes. Um, so in, in many ways, there are new models coming out. So they're going to go out and do those new things and make it work. We don't want you to make television for us. Now, what we are doing, though, is, and, and we're, we're currently sort of poking around, um, just like MTV did, um, they took their all, all their old catalog and they made VH1 out of it. Mm -hmm. Discovery has 25 years of great video. Mm -hmm. We're in there digging around in the archives. We're rooting around the attic, looking for cool things that we can repurpose. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not just going to run them. Because right. that has value in selling to Netflix. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is we can take the clips of stuff and the great video, and not that we're going to do this, but I could do like the amazing explosion of the day, and I could have ten years worth of explosions that I could. No, put but in you front could do you. the you could do a Predator channel on YouTube, and you just be you because I know like my yep my daughter likes certain genres in like she'll say I want to see a dolphin, and she'll be like I want to see a dolphin in it. Like if you just made like Discovery Channel dolphins on YouTube, and it was just a channel of dolphin footage. Mm -hmm. Yep and you just did 60 second, 90 second dolphin, you would have a million subscribers. And then you do that for turtles, and then you do it for sharks, and you just have Discovery Shark thing, and you just put up all that B footage that they must have that hasn't even been edited. You could make all kinds of interesting short videos about shark facts. If you just did sharks, a Discovery Channel for sharks, like why doesn't that exist? You know, it's interesting. There actually um, isn't that much shark footage. There is, but it's not as much as you might think. But even um, still, if you there, just but, said, there's got to be enough to put you out are, two episodes a week. You're right. There is all of those things, and yes, 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 and yes. So we, uh, we are... And everybody's stealing it anyway and putting it up there. Are you guys claiming all that stuff? Um, Has that process started to claim? It has started. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, and I'm, I've been trying to accelerate this, and we'll see where it goes, but, you know, the guys at Zephyr, and um, there are a couple other guys who are really good at helping with the claiming process. Mm. So we're integrating, you know, that sort of how does that work? Yeah. How does that ze explain to the audience what the claiming process is? Because I don't so, know if everybody's aware so, of how sophisticated so, this so is. So here's what happens. So what they do is that so YouTube has built a whole content ID system that matches up uh, audio and video to clips that go up. So let's say, for example, um, the clip that you watch right now of me saying this. YouTube will, can take that if you're in the content match system, and they'll look at the image, they'll look at the voice, they'll do a match, and then they'll just, everything that gets uploaded, they do pattern matching on mm -hmm. all of it. And if something hits, the, um, you, can, you can say a threshold, and 70%, 80%, 90%, either let me send them a takedown notice, mm -hmm. or file a claim against them, or say, you can keep it up there, but every advertisement that runs against it, I get the money, not you. That's my video. Right. And so, that's the claiming process. And it seems like a lot of people are embracing this. I think the NBA and the soccer leagues are like, if you want to remix you know, the Knicks playoffs or something like that, go ahead. We're going to claim it and take the money. And that's the way it should be, right? Yep. Uh, the people who try and stand in the way of it, it's like trying to stick your finger in the dike and a hundred other holes show up over yeah. there. The NFL does that a lot, right? They yeah. really control their product. I think we are in this. I think... If you're not setting your stuff free and letting people remix it and do their own thing with it and do add-ons and fun stuff, uh, you saw Mark Suster's column, I'm sure, earlier yeah. this week or, or late last week, wrote a great, great column about sort of the Harlem Shuffle and the remix, and being able to just do new things on it and riffing off of it. Right. 
And you should, we should be giving people the tools to do that and celebrating when they do it well. Yeah. What and making this, money off it, too. Yeah. What about this next generation of talent? I mean, you have the I. Justines of the world. You have the Veronica Belmonts. You have the Kevin Roses, whatever, or Leo Laporte's or uh, Adam Carolla's. It, are these top-level talent going to just be sustainable, independent productions? It feels like Chris Hartwick and a lot of them are, are they have a certain artistic vision they can get to sustainability with small teams. Like this week, it started up as a team of three or four. It's got a half million in revenue, which I think makes it probably one of the top ten that's podcasts. Good. That's, probably. That's great. And we don't even actually. We're not really even working on it that hard. Like we're not like in, d investing doubly. We just want to make it sustainable and great for the community. I, is that the future of this, or is it going to be people collecting a bunch of shows? Um, it's a really good question. I think. Um, I think there is an ability to collect some of this stuff, but there aren't a lot of really talented people in this medium who can do a really good job at it and make it successful. Now, and, and look, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah. I think um, you look at some of the stars that have come up on YouTube and you wonder, are they able to translate that into broader success? So Justine, love Justine, she's awesome. And I, I, I really believe she's a great talent and can do that. Um, Annoying Orange, uh, Dane has done that and created a great show on Nickelodeon. Yeah. Uh, Nick Kids, wait, Cartoon Network, one or the other. Yeah. Um, I don't watch that network very often. Um, you look at Fred, and Fred was able to do it. I'm not sure how many people are going to be able to do that. To make the jump up. To make the jump. Yeah. And I believe that in this medium that we're in now, it just as we saw with um, magazines and newspapers, it's, it's almost like there's a lowest common denominator at work where people are going to be able to make money. It's going to be hard to build a really big business just focused on this. What do these YouTube stars make in your estimation? Like the top 100, what do they make a year if they're getting 100 million views a year or a billion views I was, a year? I was thinking about this. I think if you're doing 20 million views a month, you're probably clearing about 50,000 bucks. So $2 CPM or something. I don't know, something like that. But, yeah. but low, low single digits. If I'm doing 20 million, and the, so the top YouTubers are doing 20 million, right? Mm -hmm. um, a month. A month. So, so you're making a half million, maybe six hundred thousand um, uh, um, dollars a year. Which is huge. Which is you can buy a Tesla. Sure, buy two. <laughs> um, buy a new one every year. But there aren't that many people who are doing twenty million a year, and then there are, but there are expenses involved in doing that, right? Yes. So it's if not just if there's a ha if half of it goes to expenses, then you're making a quarter million dollars a year, which is great. But and then you're paying half that in taxes and right. So it's okay. a nice living. It's sustainable. It's, it's sustainable. Right. It's a lifestyle business. And in three, four, five years, it could double or triple. Could. Yeah. Or maybe it'll plateau. Or maybe it'll plateau. Um, so there are very small amount of people who are doing, um, you know, 80 or 100. You look at Jenna Marbles um, and a couple of others who are doing more. So they're maybe grossing one and a half million. Right. So I'd say upper range is somewhere around there. Right. Um, Which is pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Somebody looks into the camera, you know, edits it briefly. And the great thing about it is you control it all. Yeah. So you think about the, the world, the traditional world of Hollywood is everybody takes their pieces. Mm. You get your fee and it's not a lot. In that world, it starts at 50%. Yeah. Like, I get, I already get all this. Yeah. If you want to help me, yeah. you're going to give me at least that. Yeah. And that's a lot of power. Yeah. Because they're, yeah, they're paying 45 to YouTube. They get 55. But, you know, like, why do you need, you don't need a manager, like, to get, take 10% of that, or you don't need an agent to take 15% of that, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And it, what you need is, can you do brand extensions of it? Can you yeah. do the book? Right. Right. Where's I, Justine's Guide to the iPhone? Yeah, she did do like I think she's doing video game stuff. She dabbled in video games. And well, stuff I, like I haven't that. talked with her for a little uh, while. On so. the um, yeah, on the thing. But it's going to be hard to wrangle those people, I guess. I mean, Maker had that huge blowout with um, with Ray, with Ray, Ray William Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. So did you guys try to collect a bunch of those? You had Epic Meal Time for a little while, mm -hmm. right? So, but is that a, you guys gave up on that strategy of trying to represent a lot of the big names? Or no, I think what what we. The strategy has remained the same, which is let's find people who can build really big, strong, engaged communities around themselves yeah. and then drive brands into those communities yeah. and have us both benefit. Right. We, uh, we had great success with Epic Mealtime. Um, they decided that they wanted to go in a somewhat different direction, mm. which is fine. Yeah. Um, and uh, we continue to do that in folks that we work with outside of Revision 3, we bring on as affiliates, but also building our own stuff. Yeah, see, I think that you and I came to the same... or. Perhaps we did. You tell me. But with this weekend, like I tried to do a bunch of shows, and it was always like, God, it is so hard to find somebody talented. 
And then if you do, there's so little money in it, and yet it takes such a multi-year commitment to actually, like it took me four years to get this show to where it is. Right. It took Leo eight years he's in, I guess, seven or eight years. It took Kevin. Leo's been doing this since 92, but... Well, but, no, but I'm saying extension. he sort no, of no, quit no. seven years. It's an extension years, of what years, yeah. he did, exactly, yeah, seven mean, or eight years. It takes a long time. And you've got to be committed to it. I mean, it, Dignation, Kevin and Alex, they were done with it. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think Kevin's like, Their how many years are going to sit on the couch, the couch and, drink and drink beer? and pretend I'm 25. Right. It was actually getting a little bit sad, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> I think that's sort of the, uh, the line of it. But it's just, it's hard to do a roll-up of that. I think it's interesting that Adam Carolla actually even da- went into this. Yeah. What do you think of what he's doing? I like what he's doing. I think yeah. he's brilliant. Yeah. I think he's really smart. I think I like what Kevin Hardwick is doing. Yeah, the Nerdist the stuff. The Nerdist stuff is really interesting. Remember, Kevin came from a television background. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's great. And did he? What did he do before? He was a G four. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, he was on a. T- I think he was on Attack of the Show because Ryan Vance, who runs our program production, was there for a long time, and he worked with. with it's quite an alumni now because of who's the one who went to do the newsroom show. Um, who was the girl who was on Attack of the Show? Oh, woman. Um, I'm sorry. I, um, saying, I gotta stop saying girls when I mean women. Uh, I know who, who you was mean. the woman who's Olivia. Olivia uh, Olivia Munn, Munn was on it, and she went. She was on the Daily Show and has done a bunch of stuff. And now yeah. she, I think she was in a movie, and I think she also now does. The, she's definitely on the newsroom. Yep. Well, look at the, the Tech TV. I mean, there's a, and then they get Leo Laporte from Tech TV, Kevin Rose from Tech TV. You were in Tech TV. Erica Hill. Erica Hill. Erica Hill was a PC Week Radio intern and then uh-huh. was our anchor at Tech TV. Veronica Belmont. No, it wasn't Tech TV. She was on... Um, right. Veronica. Well, Veronica was on at CNET. At CNET and then yeah. um, also, early TV. before Tech TV, we had uh, the site that we launched with MSNBC. Oh. Soledad O'Brien was the host Soledad of the site. Soledad O'Brien Remember was... Remember Soledad? Yeah. She was... A, and uh, she was Soledad's a web awesome. person. Yeah. Um, but the Tech TV alumni is quite a group now. Yeah. They've all gone on to, in a lot of cases, have independent. What happened to the guy who was Olivia Munn's partner on the show? What was his name? I forgot his name. That was post my time there. Yeah. But, um, uh, well, Ad- so Adam Sessler just came back yeah. to um, Revision 3. Adam did, when we launched ZDTV, which became Tech TV, right. there, were, there was a four, five, six shows. There was Screen Savers with right. Laporte. There was um, um, Extended Play TV with Adam Sessler, which is our mm-hmm. video game show. There was a show called Fresh Gear that I hosted. Um, of course, I lasted a couple of years and I was done. Leo's still doing his Leo thing. Right. Adam went off to G4 and did right. G4. He did, well, it was GameSpot TV, actually, because we, yep. we owned GameSpot when we launched. And it became Extended Play, then X Play. Now he's back at Revision 3 doing his gaming coverage again. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of interesting people out of there. And um, what, what do you think the reaction of Hollywood's going to be to what's happening on YouTube. I mean, they seem to be waking up to it a little bit. There's a little bit of dabbling, but the TV business seems to be doing so well that they're not really engaging that much. Am I right in thinking that? I think you're right. I think what we're seeing now is that Hollywood, certain parts of Hollywood are seeing that there's money in there, mm-hmm. and they're all starting to come in and say, how do I get a piece of this? Right. i got to figure it out. How do I get my agent 10%? How do I yeah. get my manager? How do, I, how do I get my package on this? Yeah. And so they're thinking... In a mercenary sense, there might be a quick hit to have here. Or a longer term thing of how okay. do I get a talent and grow with them Got and it. build that up. Um, I think, uh, you know, on the TV side, I thought for a long time that TV was going to fall fast like we saw with magazines and music. Yeah, me too. Um, but it didn't. It didn't. Why? Um, well, in part, it's the entrenched way that we consume television. In part, they saw the mistakes and uh. didn't. Think about it. Discovery does not release its full episodes for free to watch online. Mm. What do we do on magazines, right? We're yeah. putting all our articles online for yeah, free. Yeah, they're like free, yeah. What do we do with music? Ah, oh, Napster just took it over. Yeah. So there was, there was some learning there. Mm. It's also the infrastructure is different. Um, I, I still think that it's going to... I thought... It, I, I, I think now it's going to be a, a slower ramp. It will be disintermediated, but it's going to take 10 or 15 years. There are people at Discovery, other people I talk to, who think it's going to happen much more quickly mm. and that we will see it fall apart in the next two or three years. Really? See, yeah. I, my, I think the quality has gone up. I mean, just think about like 10 or 20 years ago, it was like, oh, there was a Soprano, so it was like one good show on TV. Right. Maybe two or three. And then everybody saw like The Shield or The Sopranos where all these like innovative programs do really well. And now it's just like Walking Dead and Warwick Empire and just... But I so th- many great shows, and you can watch them with binge viewing, and well, they're available everywhere. And the thing that I think we're seeing, and this is the really interesting pivot starting to happen, is what Netflix did 
right? With um, House of Cards. House of Cards. Brilliant. They released all 13 episodes at once. Yeah, who, who wants to be, go through this painful weekly agita? Why do I need a network that I watch every week when uh, I can just go watch all of them all at once? If they're good. If they're good. They or be I can good. move on. Right, exactly. So much better. So th there's so much change happening, and I'm not smart enough to be able to say where it's going to go because I thought I was going to go one way and I didn't go there. And yeah. um, but I think it saved it. I think this like binge viewing saved it because what happened used to be if you missed a show, it was like, well, I missed a show. What, 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 how am I going to see it again? I'm going to go buy a bunch of DVDs. It's a pain in the ass. But then you think about it now, it's like, well, you oh you you're just hearing about Downton Abbey. It's season three. It's almost over. It's watch like, one, watch two. Yeah, just, oh, you can. We could talk about it next week. You know, you can binge view the whole season one this week, and I'll talk to you about it at next week's poker game. So I saw that's the, what happens at my poker game. I saw the head of AMC talk uh, recently, and he was saying, "Look, when um, The Walking Dead, right? Yeah. So what happens is they put The Walking Dead out on Netflix, yeah. and they find that when they do that, people watch the first couple of seasons." and their premiere for the next season goes through the roof. Of course. Because they do that, because everybody wants to know what happens. It's caught up. Right? I mean, I just like, all these, uh, all these uh, idiots I play poker with, like, they keep talking about uh, Justified. Right. Just, uh, the wire and Justified. The wire and back and forth. Uh, and then they were talking about girls, and I'm just like, okay, fine, I'll watch it. Then I, I go, watch some of these then shows. Then I start watching these shows, and I'm like, these things are fracking addicting. Yeah. And they're just taking over my life. I'm like, I don't have time to watch all these shows. You just... Uh, but the, so here's so justified. The first I watched the first three episodes. You watched it justified. No, no, no. But, but so don't start it because the first three episodes are so goddamn good. Now I'm just sitting here like a, I got to get the launch festival done, and I'm like I can't wait to watch these next twenty episodes. I put myself on a ban. I just I justified ban. So let's go back to the yeah. uh, the cost per episode thing because it ties into what you were just saying. Yeah. What we're seeing is we're seeing so many great programs that are so expensive to create. I mean, I was watching Game of Thrones. The open of Game of Thrones has to have cost more than my entire budget for content last year, right? Yeah. Amazing. And that's just the open. So we're seeing this bifurcation, I think, of media, mm. where we're going to have a few of these really beautiful, amazing things that happen, and then there's going to be a lot of stuff, like what we're doing now, Yeah. that's going to be much lower cost, that we are going to have our binge viewing, but then we're going to have all these other things that we just kind of enjoy and watch. And so I see that bifurcation of media So you happening. either win by having this massive, amazing production value that soars past everything, or great long-tail content that just connects deeply with the smaller subset. Mid-tail niche content or long-tail yeah. niche content, yeah. yeah. And that's the bifurcation, I think, that's happening. And so what that means, if you play that out, yeah. we're not going to have as many um, cable networks anymore. Mm -hmm. The cable networks that do a good job on the high-end stuff and they can draw those big audiences in will survive. The they'll, ones they'll that do don't, better, we're not going to pay for it. They're going to do better. Yeah. Um, and so the AMCs of the world, the discoveries, are going to just take over. And then, if I don't know, if your logo or HGTV or whatever it is, it's just going to have a harder and harder time because they don't have the budgets to compete. But look at AMC. I mean, they, they do a couple great series a year, maybe five or ten. Is that enough to compete as a network? I don't know. Yeah, they got to do more. But they keep to doing more, I think. Like Showtime actually seems to be doing more and people more People pay for Showtime, so right. it's yeah, a different it's model. It's Netflix. Right yeah. Showtime, HBO, and Netflix. Yeah. Netflix, they're the same thing now. They are the they same thing, They just have thing, slightly they? different ways to get customers. They are the same exact thing. And this house of cards is going to embolden them. Oh, my God. So they, much. I saw a statistic. 86% 86, 86 of people said house of cards um, would... I think the way they phrased it was 86% of people said it would keep them from unsubscribing. Look at what's happened to Netflix stock. If that's I, just 50% correct. So so I, I um, bought a little Netflix stock about a year ago when it was at 80 or 90. And now it's at 300. And I held on to it. Now it's, it's closed about 200. But it's only in, Hello. The, only in the last... I know, I, only, I didn't buy enough of it. It was like stupid me. I've got to stick to the courage of my convictions. But I'm not a gambler like you. <laughs> um, but... Uh, actually, I'm not a smart gambler like you because you actually know <laughs> that what you're would doing. be uh, <laughs> that would be debatable. <laughs> but, but but anyway, it's it, it it only went up in the last really month or so because they reported better results. But then it got the kicker from House of Cards, and we were like, oh, there's something there. Yeah, there's really something there. And it, well, luckily, it seems like it's a good show. And Arrested Development comes next. Yeah, that's right. So it's going to be like if Arrested <laughs> Development is good and House of Cards was pretty good. That's going to just, I think they're going to tear the doors off and do a like. Well, they're doing an Arrested Development movie as well. Right, but they're doing another series. No, no, I know, but I, I, the movie oh, is no, the no, either going to be before or after. I forget which. Oh, wow. But, the, but both will play together. Genius. Well, so and look, look at what the other folks, I call them the four horsemen of the stream apocalypse, right? So it's Netflix. Amazon. Amazon. Hulu. Apple. Hulu. Yeah. So actually, take Netflix out, but it's, um, it's Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, um, 
Netflix. No, Hulu. my uh, Google. Google. Those are the real four, right? Right. Right. So, Hulu and Netflix are kind of out there. Yeah. But you look at what those four are doing, right? Mm. So Microsoft hired Nancy Tellum. Yeah, she's got 150 people in Santa Monica making stuff. I know. So nobody knows what she's making. Do you know what she's making? No. I don't know if she knows what she's doing. Do you have a meeting with her yet? I, or I, no? I know her from her CBS days. Uh, we, ch we chatted in December and she was still trying to figure it out. Uh, so, that's what which, I hear. which you can imagine. I mean, she was like, in for a couple weeks. What's going yeah. on at this Microsoft thing? Yeah. Uh, Amazon is doing their own original stuff. Amazon Studios, they're optioning scripts. Yeah, I think so. Amazing. I saw that. No, they are. They, they so, optioned um, the Zombie Land for a TV show. Right. So, Amazon's doing it, Microsoft's doing it, Google. Not yet. They well, through well, YouTube. They put money in Machinima. Yeah, They YouTube. dropped $100 million into sure. $200 million now. Yeah. Where's Apple? Where is Apple? $140 billion in cash in a huge... The lar Apple is the largest hedge fund in the world with $140 billion in cash. Did you know that? Wow. The largest no, hedge fund a, in the world. That's wild. Yeah, you wouldn't even think they could buy... like They could be like Blackstone. We were buying SeaWorld and all this other kind of stuff, just buying huge stuff. And they are afraid to be in the content business. They absolutely should be leaning into this. What are they doing? Why don't they hire somebody? Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. What to about what Yahoo, happens. too? Shouldn't Yahoo be doing this? Yahoo that? is doing it. Yahoo's they do original programming. Well, yeah, but look at like, Yahoo. Yes, they do original programming. They, they do have that, that Tom Hanks thing. Yeah. Remember that cartoon? The, like, yeah. Incredibly violent I never cartoon? saw it. I never saw it either. Yeah. So, um, but AOL is doing it as well. Mm. AOL's been um, dabbling here. So I think, and this goes back to what you started off with, which is, you know, you ought to own your own content. Hmm. The brand is where the value is. Yeah. Yeah. Or having a network, one or the other. Either you own the Cosby show or your NBC. Right. But NBC, again, what you own, then you can option it out. Mm. Then you can put it in windows around the world. Sure. It's, you can have your shark content and put it all over the world. Genius. Yeah. Jim, this has been a great episode. Everybody follow Jay Louderback. It's L O U D E R B. J Louder B on Twitter. J Louder B. Um, one thing I do want to say Twitter. though is um, I have started doing with our YouTube funded channel Tech Feed. Oh. I started doing a show every week. You do? Kind of getting back into it a little bit. What's the show? Uh, this is called Downloaded. It's basically it's what I used to do with this week with um, um, with uh, at Ziff Davis with um, stuff. It's just it's basically just talking about the top stories of the day. We sit around. Oh, cool. Talk about the top stories of the week. Three or four, three or four of us, and just kind of babble about it. Oh. It's. It's Skype really it, you just Skype fun. Guest no, or go no, to no. Guest? You gotta be in the, gotta be there. All right. Well, I'm in San, San Francisco. Francisco. I'll come in. But no, I encourage people to watch it. So go to YouTube.com/slash/TechFeed. Download it as one of the six shows or seven shows on that channel. It's hard awesome. to find, but it's fun. We just talk about what's you know. Hey, do me a favor, um, Brandis. At this point in the show, or actually in the beginning of the show, like in the first minute, just put a big annotation that says "Check out" and link to uh, Jim's show. Yeah. So put the annotation right here. No, here. No, put it here. No, put it, put it over here. So on the it, microphone, click the microphone. It's kind of it's kind of fun doing something again. Yeah. It's you know I I think I have so much respect for you for Kevin for Leo to be able to stick with it and do it. It's exhausting. I'll be it's honest. It's I just I've been doing it for the last you know every Friday for the last three or four months. It and takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy. When you get uh, out, do you feel like you just ran a marathon? I get out of the show. I mean I, I'm a little bit pumped, but also it's like the amount of creative energy it takes. People don't get this to host the show. To host the show, it's so much. And you energy. have to be alert. Yep. I have to be listening to everything you're saying. To have the follow-up question ready. It's a, it's an intense thing. What we do though is, um, um, we drink beer on the show, so it's oh, that mellows it out a little. <laughs> a little bit. hat tip too. I <laughs> borrowed that from Dignation. Yeah, exactly. By the way. You did learn something over the yes, last exactly. six years of suffering <laughs> through web video. Yeah, it's it has with, been. It has been better. a little bit painful. It has been, but it's been. Fun. You know what? It's fun. We're we're creating a new media right here. Yeah, and I mean that fun. does make it easier to get through the day. Well, the challenge is that you're doing something so innovative. Well, look, if you're not having fun with what you're doing, don't do yeah. it, right? Yeah, that's that's the good. ultimate thing. You're having yeah. a blast doing what you do. Oh, you I always do. do. Yeah. I mean, you can tell. Yeah. Everything you write, everything is... It's like, Jason's just, he's poking the bear and he's having fun with it. Yeah, I don't... I wouldn't do it if I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're good at it. Well... <laughs> the bear doesn't like it, but you're good at it. <laughs> Well, listen, everybody go check out Revision 3 and uh, continued success and congrats to Discovery. I think they got, they got the deal of the century to get all those great brains inside the organization. Um, Thank and you. it's great to have you on the program. Thanks again to our sponsors. And um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Jason. And if you want to follow the show, it's at TWI Startups, TWI Startups. And go ahead and post to the comments. Um, because that's a great thing to do. Post the comments. Thank you to our incredible sponsors at Squarespace, at ShareFile for their support, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups.